Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to be working on post-processing and specifically we're going to be working on basic post-processing. Next time we work on this, we'll probably go over how to do custom post-processing. But for this one, we're just going to be focusing on the inbuilt tools and the inbuilt nodes. So in order to do that, we're going to go through all of the different parts of the world environment node and how each of them work. And then we're going to go over a couple presets that I've made, just kind of showcasing what it's capable of. So let's go ahead and dive in. Now, first off, we need to go ahead and create a world environment. So you can see the environment is kind of already defaulted to a preset here. Now, normally tone map and glow would be on, but we're going to turn those off and we're just going to hit add environment to scene. And you'll notice in the scene hierarchy, we now have a world environment node. And if we expand the environment within, we have a bunch of different options. We're going to go through these one by one and kind of go over how each one of them works. The background node is kind of a reference point for the ambient light, reflected light, and the sky nodes, and it kind of defines what the background of the world looks like whenever there isn't geometry. So if we just set this to custom color, you can obviously see the result. Now, something to be aware of, the ambient light and the reflective light both source this as their reference, but you can override each one of those independently to whatever you would like them to look like. Now underneath sky, we have a sky material here, and we've defaulted this to the procedural sky material, which works just fine out of box. There's quite a few options here for various things like the color of the sky and things like that. So you can kind of go wild. Now, something to be aware of, the sun effect is kind of lackluster when it comes down to it. And so I tend to replace it with some sort of image or effect for the actual sun. But for now, this will work just fine. So we'll leave all that at B and we'll move on to the ambient light. Now the ambient light is once again referencing the background and it's just kind of anytime there isn't any light, this is what's shown. So if we set this to color and then set the color to something like pink, you can obviously just see the result. And this defaults to the background, which pretty much overrides everything with just in this case, whatever the sky looks like. And this actually works out pretty good. This ends up with a fairly consistent and universally okay result. Though, obviously, if you're going to go for more stylized looks, you're probably going to want to override this. Now, the reflected light does the exact same thing, but for reflections. So if we disable this, you can obviously see the results on the shiny objects in the scene. Following that, we can go on to Tone Map. Now, Tone Map is a little bit different. Tone Map is how the engine converts HDR content, that's high dynamic range content, to LDR content, so that's low dynamic range, for the monitors to visualize. Now, the majority of people don't have HDR monitors. I do actually have an HDR monitor, but Godot out of box doesn't support HDR. I believe it's on the roadmap, but for now it doesn't support it. As a result, we do need a tone mapper to convert that HDR content to LDR content. And in this case, it defaults to linear. Linear is going to result in a fairly bland look. If we set it up to Reinhardt, it's going to be a bit brighter, and then Filmic is going to be a bit more contrast. Now, Aces is a little bit different than the other modes, though. Aces is actually using the film industry standard for converting from HDR content to LDR content. As a result, it's a little bit more performance costly, but the result does look a lot more visually appealing to me personally. Now, in specific with dark environments like caves and things like the previous series at the FPS horror series, I actually ended up going with Reinhardt just because it was brighter and it ended up resulting in an environment that was a little bit more appealing in that case, but something to be aware of going forward. The next option is the SSR, so that's Screen Space Reflections. If we turn this on, you can see the obvious result immediately. And this does tend to get a bit of a bad rap, despite the fact that I think it does look fairly convincing when you aren't using any other reflection options. When you're just using this option, it doesn't look too bad. Now, the obvious downside is since it is screen space, it doesn't reflect anything you can't see. So right here, there should be reflection of the white object, but because that sphere is in the way and visually we can't see it, there is nothing there the reflection. Now, something to be aware of with the max steps, if you increase them, you can obviously see more reflections on objects. If you increase it too much, you will incur a significant performance cost. Now, the next option is SSAO. Now, SSAO actually has quite a few options, and SSAO, or Screen Space Ambient Occlusion, kind of works in a manner to simulate the way light behaves in real life. Basically, anywhere that there's a crevice, it will darken artificially to kind of simulate light not reaching that location. If you increase its intensity, you can see the obvious result, and this is used in a lot of video games. It was kind of popularized, I think, with Gears of War and the Unreal Engine, but it since became pretty much a staple of all video game engines and it tends to ground objects in the environment and make them look like they're all cohesive and they work together. 
We go ahead and turn that off and move on to SSIL, which is screen space illumination. Screen space illumination kind of works like a global illumination, but very cheaply and only in screen space. Thus, by being in screen space, it also has the same downsides as SSR, where things that you can't see do not create global illumination where they normally should. Now, something to be aware of specifically on SSIL, if you decrease the normal rejection, you are going to get slightly better results around the edges of objects. You can see now these are lit up properly, but that's because they're ignoring the fact that this is separated from them in depth. So you can see the background over here is lit up, where in this case it should be, but in other cases you might end up with slightly in correct results. Now if we turn that off and turn on its big brother, which is SDFGI or Sign Distance Field Global Illumination, it creates a much more convincing look. This actually uses a voxelization technique to kind of create a stand-in for the environment which allows it to create much more accurate results. You can see here the ceiling is illuminated by this object which has emission on it. And behind the red pillar, you can actually see it is now darker because the illumination does not reach there. And obviously this side is illuminated by that just object with an emission texture on it. This also by extension gets you some free results in the reflections category. If we select the sphere over here, we decrease the normal map and we decrease the roughness, you can actually see the voxelized geometry. You can kind of see how that white pillar is kind of merged with the ceiling. The end result is it's a little bit wonky if you look at it directly like this, but the upside is if you do have a normal map on or just a little bit of roughness, the end result can be very convincing for essentially free reflections. Now, something to be aware of, these voxels don't update regularly. So this object right here, I have it set to not actually render to the voxels. And I do that by going down here to the global illumination tab on the geometry instance and setting its mode to disabled. If that was set to enabled, it would render to these voxelized geometry, but it would not update regularly as the voxelized geometry is only updated when you leave an area and come back. And as a result, if you move this sphere, you would see like a floating sphere in the reflections. So obviously not ideal. Now there's a lot of options down here. I'll leave those to you to mess with. I will say the minimum cell size is going to affect all of the different distances having to do with how far away you can see the voxelized geometry. If you set that down, you will get more detailed voxelized geometry, but as a result, you can't see it as far away. So the cascades can kind of compensate for that and increase the view distance of the voxelized geometry, but that's going to cause more of a performance problem. So it's kind of a give or take, bounce back and forth, see what works for you. Now the next option is Glow, and it's commonly referred to as Bloom in other game engines, and it can result in a very nice convincing look if you keep its strength toned down a little bit. You can see it even works on reflections pretty much anywhere that's bright, it just blooms it out like our eyes are kind of having a hard time perceiving the brightness. The mode here can have a big impact on how this is perceived. So if you set it to screen, obviously it's a lot more powerful, but if you set it to soft light, it can be a lot more gentle, it can be a lot less noticeable. Now, a particular note on this one is the map field. Now, the map allows you to kind of filter it by a texture. So if we take a lens dirt texture here and we apply it and then we just boost up that strength a lot, you can see on the edges of the bloom a kind of dirty effect. We said to screen, it's even more noticeable. So this is a particular note if you happen to have a game where your character is looking through a helmet or glasses or something like that. This can be used to great effect to actually simulate that. Now the next two options are kind of interconnected. The first one is fog and that pretty much does what it says on the 10. It just creates linear fog that fills up the background. This can be great for adding depth, though I typically always tone it down a bit. And then I always tend to tint it a little bit towards the atmospheric colors, so a little bit bluer. And I also tend to tone down the sky effect. Now something you can do is actually select the light color and just sample from the background. This will fade it out to whatever the background color is. And then you can just set the sky effect down to zero so that that way it doesn't affect the background color at all. And if you happen to have mountains or something here, this would probably actually look ideal. Now, in addition to this, we have volumetric fog. Now, volumetric fog kind of works the same way, but it's a lot more realistic. You can actually see the sun shafts here where it's darker underneath the pillar. And this is because it's actually using a voxelization technique to kind of create a grid of points that defines how dense the fog is at any given location. Now, this is very powerful on its own, but more importantly, it allows for a new node to be added to the scene. And that's the fog volume node. If we just add one, you can see there's a little clump of fog right here that actually can interact with the environment and receive shadows and everything. And it can be of great help if you want to try and do something like smoke grenades or anything like that. 
or just localized fog volumes. And there's density textures and stuff here. I'm not gonna get into it. I'm probably gonna do an entire video just on fog in the future. But for the time being, be aware that this will not work unless volumetric fog is turned on. Now, last but not least, we have the adjustments tab. Now the adjustments tab out of the gate just gives you some brightness, some contrast and some saturation controls which can be very helpful, but the color correction down here is kind of where the true power of this lies. So if we go ahead and set the color correction to just a gradient texture 1D, we can kind of see what the intention is here. So on the right hand side, we have light colors and on the left hand side, we have dark colors. And if we just set the light colors to say blue, you can see now everything that is lighter is blue and everything that is darker is just the normal of whatever it was. So let's say we take a mid range and we say all the mid ranges we want to be red. And you can see now we have direct manipulation of the colors in the game. Now this is very powerful on its own, but there's an even more powerful way to use it. And that's with what is called a lookup table. So if we select the neutral LUT and we go ahead and open that in a file manager, you can see the lookup table or the LUT is a series of images that goes from left to right. And this can be used to map the color range of the game. Now the neutral LUT is provided on the Godot documentation, so you can download it there. And if we go ahead and import it into a photo editing software like Photoshop, we can edit this LUT and thus edit the color range. So for example, here we have an image in the background, which is just a screenshot of the unedited environment. And if we say, for example, turn the entire environment into sepia tones and then export this LUT down here, just cropping out everything but this LUT and then re-import it into Godot, we can actually make the environment look exactly like it is in the Photoshop. So if we go back over here, we have that Sapia LUT and there's a couple import options here. It defaults to texture 2D, but we want it on texture 3D. And then on the horizontal slices, we're gonna to set to 33 and on vertical, we're gonna to set to one. And if we select the world environment and just drag that in as the color correction, you can now see it looks exactly like it did in Photoshop. Now, something to be aware of here, you don't just have to leave it there. You can actually edit things about it. Like for example, you can compress the image. And if we compress, you can see there's now this banding artifact that are resulting in this. And you can get kind of a stylized look by using these different methods. Now, in addition to this LUT, I've actually created several others, but they're part of the other environments here. So let's go over those real quick. So let's go ahead and go over those. So the first environment that I created, I'm calling the cotton candy environment. And it just generally bumps up the saturation of everything, kind of tints everything pink and makes everything very bright and colorful and smooth. Now down here in the bubblegum LUT, you can actually see that I've heightened the reds and the pinks and made everything else just kind of lighter color in general. And there's not really any blacks anymore. Now, in addition to the cotton candy environment, I've also created the gritty environment, which pretty much goes in the opposite direction. We have everything being a little bit browner. We obviously have some fog in there. And then we also, on top of that, went ahead and implemented that map for the glow and kind of toned down all the colors with the exception of red. So if there's a red splatter for any reason, I don't know, ketchup, then it would look a lot more vibrant than it would normally look. And this can be used to make a much more gritty, realistic looking environment. Maybe it's something a bit more like Modern Warfare or Battlefield or something. So hopefully this has given you a little bit of insight into how it works and hopefully it's given you a little bit of inspiration to implement your own tests. All of the different LUTs that I've created here will be in the GitHub as well as all of the different environments. Feel free to use them, play with them, do whatever you like. But as always, thank you all for watching. I hope you all have a wonderful week. We'll see you all back here next week for the next tutorial.